Hey guys, Reese here and welcome back to another video. Now I hear this all the time from new investors. They are looking to get into real estate and they love the appeal of those cheap properties, those 10, 15, $20,000 homes that they say they're going to buy all cash and that way they don't have a mortgage and they can maybe buy a couple of them and get a jump start in real estate with you know relatively low money seeing how you know maybe the average home in the area is $150,000, $200,000. And unfortunately they're lulled by that deceptively cheap home price, the high rent to sale price ratio, you know, where you know that $15,000 home might still rent out for $500 a month. In my market, the average investor looks for the 1% rule. So say you have $1,000 a month in rent, the, you wouldn't want to make, pay more than $100,000 for that home. Well, these new investors, they see that $500 a month is still coming in the, for a three bedroom, but that three bedroom is say only $15,000 to purchase. That's what a 3% rule? That's incredible, that's phenomenal. And they get lulled by those deceptively high returns and cheap purchase price and easy access. And while cheap properties may look good from the outside to that new investor, today I wanna to share with you guys why in most cases it's a horrible idea to buy these cheap homes and you should really only invest in these homes if you want to lose money, time, and potentially your sanity as well. <laughs> So guys, if that sounds good to you, go ahead and give this video a like. I really appreciate it. And if you're new to the channel, go ahead and subscribe as well. We are so incredibly close to a thousand subscribers. I really appreciate all of you. Super excited to continue growing my channel, can continue to share my journey and what I've learned along the way, and hopefully learn a little bit from you guys as well. So thanks so much and let's dive right into this video. Now, when I say cheap properties, I don't mean, you know, that $100,000 home that is severely discounted because it needs a renovation and you know you can put fifty thousand dollars into that and have it turn into a two hundred fifty thousand dollar home you know that is cheap relative to what the arv the after repair value is and that's a great way to get started investing and that's a great way to force value and you know within a few months of renovations add a hundred thousand dollars to your net worth that's amazing what I mean by cheap properties are those kind of war zone D-class neighborhoods, you know, 10 to $50,000 properties. And now I'm well aware that, you know, in many markets, $50,000 will go a lot farther than it does here in Columbus. So you might be in a suburb somewhere and $50,000 buys you a nice house in a decent B-class neighborhood. Well, that's a perfectly fine investment. However, I'm talking more about those cheap properties that are in those really you know lower grade neighborhoods d maybe even c neighborhoods and they are 10 to fifty thousand dollars and you know in certain markets maybe d-class neighborhoods those properties sell for more than that amount maybe they sell for 75 to hundred thousand dollars if you're near a big city and so while i wouldn't really consider that cheap a hundred thousand dollar property i'd still avoid those d-class neighborhoods however we'll talk about that in another video you know but these properties that i'm referring to they're cheap because they are, you know, in bad locations. You know, these areas are ridden with crime and drug problems. Uh, there's going to be a lot of headaches that go along with these properties. And so the first reason I'd avoid these properties at all cost, even though they have the lure of high returns, is due to the age old saying in real estate, location, location, location. You can improve the physical condition of a property. And that's what flippers or Burr real estate investors do all the time. They buy a property that needs a cosmetic renovation, or for those more advanced, maybe they do some other more intense renovation, and they either flip it for a profit because they added enough value, or they hold it long term. However, there's nothing you can do by yourself to the neighborhood. You know, you would need years and hundreds to thousands of investors investing money into these, you know, D class neighborhoods to turn them into a C or a B class neighborhood. And so it's extremely risky for the new investor to go buy, you know, these $10,000 properties and bank on the fact that like, oh, well, this neighborhood can't get any worse. It can only go up from here. Right. And I see it. New investors say that all the time. It's like, well, it's a $10,000 property. It can't possibly get cheaper. It certainly can get cheaper or you might just burn it down to the ground yourself and take the insurance money because of how miserable it is managing it. So no, don't do that insurance fraud. But you know, 
that's that's the mindset they have is they think well the neighborhood will always get will move forward and get better over time but that's not necessarily the case these neighborhoods can stay depressed for you know 30 40 50 years and you're going to be that slumlord investor who can't afford to pour money into these properties well because they have no money and because the neighborhood doesn't justify any improvements because the home values are not increasing. And so while there's a chance that, you know, you could be that investor that got in before anybody else buys a hundred properties at $10,000 a piece and now they're all worth $100,000, that's extremely unlikely. And even if it is the case, it's gonna be 10 to 20 years from now, whereas you could jump on a little bit later in the cycle and buy into a hotter neighborhood with a lot of investor interest, a lot of money being poured into the neighborhood, maybe buy that property at $50,000 instead of 10, but it takes you three years for that to turn into 100,000. It's better to buy in the path of progress and really ride the wave of other investors and not be that first you know, leading investor. That's what a lot of big companies do. They'll have a 500 unit apartment building, mixed use with office and retail and all sorts of things, and they'll buy 50 of these $10,000 homes, tear them down to the ground, and then build up this beautiful new building. And then that starts the gentrification process and that starts to bring up the neighborhood. But they can do that, one, because they have a ton of money, primarily investor money, and they can make big changes at one point in time, not little, you know, one house at a time changes. In addition, D-class neighborhoods or just, you know, rougher neighborhoods in general tend to show very slow appreciation. So, you know, the average that people look for is between, you know, maybe two to four, three to four percent annual appreciation on their assets. Well, buying a D-class neighborhood, you might have flat appreciation or one percent appreciation for 10 years before investor interest sparks demand in that neighborhood and then you start to, you know, appreciate faster. And one of the biggest and best ways to make money in real estate is through appreciation. And we see that you miss out on so much money by not having appreciation or even having just a little bit of appreciation on a super cheap home. Say you buy a $10,000 house and you're getting 1% annual appreciation because it's the ghetto. Well, that's $100 in added, that's $100 increase to your net worth every single year. Next to nothing. Or you can use leverage, which is a very powerful tool in real estate, and buy a $100,000 home in a B-class neighborhood and only put $10,000 down because it's a single family and you're gonna live in it and put 10% down. And so you're getting three to 4% annual appreciation in this B-class neighborhood, which let's go with four is $4,000. And you only have $10,000 invested because you used leverage. Now you're making 40% on your money in annual appreciation, whereas you are making $100 a year on a $10,000 investment in a D-class neighborhood. I don't know what the return on that is. What, 0.1% on a year? I don't know what the return on that is, but it's horrible compared to the 40% you could make in a B-class neighborhood with the same investment. Now, the second reason I avoid these cheap houses at all costs is due to hidden issues and corners that have been cut. So in all reality, the cost to fix up a single family home that's in generally the same condition, same size, it's gonna cost the same amount of money. And so if you need to pour $50,000 into a $10,000 home to fix it up versus $50,000 into a $150,000 home, this is gonna be a big difference. So say the ARV on that $10,000 home is capped at $50,000 because there's just no home selling for higher than that in the neighborhood. The neighborhood is suppressed and market values will only go so high in a D-class neighborhood. Well, you're negative $10,000 because you had to put that 50 in to renovate that $10,000 home, that's $60,000 invested, and the ARV is only $50,000. Well, that $100,000 home that you invested $50,000 into is worth now $250,000, $300,000. And so you're in at 150 and now you've made $100,000 in equity. And so right here shows the benefit of investing in a B-class or better neighborhood and also shows the drawback and, and major issue of investing in these cheap properties is that investors cannot afford to invest money into their properties. So, you know, what might cost $50,000 to do a full renovation of this property, they can't do. They need to cut corners and scale that renovation back to say a $20,000 renovation 
which means with that same $10,000 home, they're now fully invested at $30,000 and it's worth 50. So they made money on that, but they also cut a lot of corners. They hired unlicensed handymen, unlicensed contractors like electricians and plumbers. They didn't permit anything. All of these things, having the proper labor costs money and costs, you know, extra money. Whereas you can find, you know, really cheap labor, but you get what you pay for. And so coming from the new investor, purchasing maybe one of these uh, rent ready properties in a D class neighborhood. So maybe they pay 30,000, 40,000 for it. Well, you get what you pay for. You're going to constantly have problems with these houses because of the corners that have been cut. You're going to be fixing plumbing issues, circuits that are wired incorrectly due to unlicensed electricians, things that are just not up to code because nobody permitted anything, no inspectors walked through. It's really a liability nightmare. <laughs> and so as you can see already, this gaudy return of this 3% rule property, you know, $500 a month coming in and rent on a $15,000 property, well, there are hidden costs for sure that are going to start to whittle down this return that you thought you were getting. And we'll start to see this even more and more as we dive into the other issues I'm going to bring up. The third issue is a low grade product equals a low grade tenant. Since the after repair value in these neighborhoods are so low, you know, if the best houses are only selling for $50,000, no matter how much you renovate yours, you're not going to sell it for a hundred in this neighborhood. Neighborhood values are capped. And so, you know, there's only so much money you can put into these assets. And since the ARV is so low, you'll never be able to invest enough money into them to bring them up to a reasonable great asset and still make money. And so therefore investors don't invest money in these, in these assets. And so the asset remains low grade in a bad neighborhood. And therefore the only tenants that would want to live in this asset are those that have to those that have no credit, low income or unstable income, or are living off, I don't know, child support or, or some other form of fixed income. Maybe they've even had past evictions. And so when you're qualifying these tenants to live in your properties, you might as well throw out the traditional qualifying standards because you're not going to have any tenants that actually fit those standards that are applying to live in your rental. In addition, with such a low priced product and you know one that isn't well maintained, tenants won't have any reason to keep those properties nice themselves. And so every time you have unit turn, you're going to be fixing, you're going to be spending a lot of money fixing that unit up. You're probably going to have substantially more unit turn because you'll have more evictions because of lower grade tenants, higher vacancy perhaps because of those evictions as well. Every time you have to kick somebody out, they're probably going to destroy the unit. You'll probably have to reinvest money to fix it up. These are the type of tenants you deal with in these low grade neighborhoods. And so once again, you know, you may have budgeted 5% as your vacancy cost when you're running the numbers on this supposedly 3% rural property. But in all reality, you have 15% vacancy plus legal fees that you didn't account for for evictions plus, you know, higher unit turn costs due to tenants, you know, wrecking your unit every time they move out. I mean, I think we can already see where this is going, where those returns start to look pretty slim to none as we get through all these issues we didn't budget for. In addition, imagine the uh, property management nightmare of dealing with these tenants. You know, it's unfortunate to say, but these tenants tend to be major headaches. And so the property management, if you're going to hire it out, will be substantially more expensive than say an A-class property in an A-class neighborhood. You might pay 5% in an A-class neighborhood and 15% out here in a D-class neighborhood, especially since rents are lower and so they need to take a lot more money. And if you're gonna manage it yourself, well, there goes your sanity like I talked about in the very beginning of this video. I mean, kiss goodbye to passive income at this point. This is a full-time job managing these units. Number four is these types of properties are much more difficult to finance. This may not be common knowledge, but it's actually substantially more difficult to finance cheap properties, you know, properties under $50,000 or loan amounts under $50,000. So banks have costs associated with lending money. And so if they're going to lend money, they need to make that money back in interest. And if they can make a $300,000 loan that costs the same admin fees, the same, you know, lender fees, that a $50,000 loan costs, but they're making substantially more interest on the higher loan amount. And so banks 
have a loan limit cutoff. They tend to not lend loan amounts less than $50,000, which means that they require a 75 loan to value. Then you would have to find a house that's at least $65,000, $70,000 and take a loan out of $50,000 on that property just to be above their loan limits. And so there's a problem right now. A $15,000 home, I mean, you're going to have to look for private money, hard money. Even then, your interest rate's going to be through the roof because it's such a low loan amount. And more likely than not, you're just not going to be able to finance them. And so you need to put your, you know, all cash down on these properties, which may seem like it's an okay idea since it's only $10,000, $15,000, $20,000. But then your return goes straight through the floor because leverage is one of your biggest assets when it comes to buying rental property and really increasing that return. You know, real estate on its own does not earn that much money. So appreciation, 3% a year, you know, if you can force value, that is substantial, you know, that's great. But if you just buy these turnkey properties, cash flow, 6%, appreciation, maybe 3%. If you put, you know, 100% down on these properties, you're making pretty much the same return as the stock market. You might as well just invest in the stock market passively. That's where leverage comes in and really ramps up the return. And so if you can't take advantage of leverage, well, these properties get even worse, become even worse of an investment. Banks, you know, when they lend you money, this is their asset, this is your asset securing that debt. So why would a bank want to lend on a very bad asset in a very bad neighborhood? That's not as safe as a nice asset in a nice neighborhood. And so, you know, banks don't just blindly lend money on anything that appraises high enough. They also consider the neighborhood and they can reject anybody they want to, as long as it's non-discriminatory reasons. And so guys, I would highly encourage you to weigh all these costs associated with these cheap properties. You know, there are some investors out there that specialize in investing in these cheap properties and they make a lot of money doing so. It's a very different business model than investing in other types of real estate. And it comes with a lot of hidden challenges, hidden costs, headaches, you know, a lot of, a lot of issues you don't have with better grade properties. And so before any of you get lulled into investing in these $15,000 homes, consider those extra costs. Is it worth your time, your energy, your sanity? And you know, are you willing to put up with that? Or would you maybe want to save just a little bit more money, bring out a partner perhaps, if you, you know, maybe you want to invest in these cheap homes because you can't qualify for financing. Well, bring out a partner, you know, maybe you bring the down payment, they bring the lendability, Maybe they bring all the money and the lendability and you do all the work and find the deal. There's so many ways you can get into more expensive real estate and make substantially more money with substantially less headache and you don't have to compromise and go for these cheaper homes. You just might have to bring out a partner. Once again, if you enjoyed this video, please leave it a like. I really appreciate it. I also would love to see all your comments down below. I answer every single one of them. I really appreciate it. And if you're still sticking around now, as you can see, I'm in a temporary set right now. I understand it's echoey in here. I apologize. But if you have any ideas on how I can improve my set and make it good without copying, you know, Graham Stephan or Andre Jick, I'd love your suggestions. I'm going to start to build this out shortly. So I'd really appreciate any suggestions. So guys, thanks so much. And I'll see you all in the next video.